meeting of the Environment Select Committee. I'm Councillor Will Pascal, uh, Chair of the Select Committee, and can I welcome everyone to this meeting at this slightly earlier than usual hour. Um, the first thing, it would be appropriate for us to start with 72 seconds silence to remember those who lost their lives in the Grandfell tragedy. Thank you. Before we proceed to meeting, I would ask committee members only to switch on their microphones when they are called to speak and to turn them off as soon as they've finished. And please remain seated when you are called to speak. If the councillor wishes to speak on a particular item and is not being called, please raise your hand to gain my attention. So, um, Firstly, before um, we start the meeting, if I can also say that it's very sad news that um, our dear councillor from Earl's Court, um, Malcolm Spaulding, uh, passed away since our last meeting. Um, and there will be um, other occasions to give proper tribute to his contribution to the council. But I just wanted to say on a personal basis um, that I've always found him uh, an excellent colleague uh, one of the few engineers on the council, um, those of us who can understand a few of the technicalities. Um, and I also wanted to draw to attention the last time I saw him, when he appeared to be in good form, um, he led what I thought was one of the best representations by a councillor with the local community to this chamber, um, when he um, brought with him his fellow councillors across party uh, and members of the local community uh, to advocate for action in Earl's Court, his ward. Um, and I, I thought that it was well presented, it was um, uh, forceful but uh, proportionate, um, and he, he led it with um, understanding and care for his local community. And that's the way that I will always remember him, both that and the sort of um, discussions we had um, between the two of us about engineering aspects and so on, but it's very sad that we've lost an extremely good councillor, so that's what I want to say. Would any of my colleagues like to um, add to that? Uh, Mr Chairman, since I won't be here at the time that you <coughs> have that um, re remembrance, can I just say that um, I uh, sat on various committees with Malcolm over the years. He, he attended the Executive and Corporate Services Scrutiny Committee that I chaired when he was chair of the Environment Committee uh, and on licensing. And if there's one thing that can be said for Malcolm, he knew his business. He read every report incessantly and could quote from it uh, any page, which was more than can be said for many councillors who were sitting around the table of, of, on, on both sides. So he really took, a, took an interest. A lot of councillors maybe just come to meetings and they just flick through the papers. He, he, was, not one of, he was not one of those. And uh, he was firm, but I think he was quite fair in the, 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 uh, the, positions, the positions he took. He always argued as if he was in the court of law, of course, because he, he was making a case, um, which some people thought he, he, he went over the top. But no, he's actually making his case, and you have to make your case when you're, when you're a councillor. 
So I think it's hugely sad that somebody who's given a lot of time to local government should die so suddenly. Uh, I have no idea why he why he passed away, but um, you know, n n no one uh, should have to go like that, as a, as it were. So I just add my uh, my comments to what you said, m m Mr. Chairman, and. Uh, um, when the time comes, I hope there'll be a lot more people that will, I assume, will, will speak up. But yes, he was a councillor from the other side, but I did respect um, the fact that he took it seriously. Uh, he, he didn't just drop into committees and, and flick through the papers. He, he, he was the real business, and uh, I expect that uh, his, his constituents, I think he was going to continue, was he, uh, would, 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 would probably miss him, the ones that were dealing with him in casework and so on. I assume he was just exactly the same in casework. So that's all I've got to say. <coughs> and, and can I just add, and if, you, if you've skipped over apologies, Councillor Thaxter will be here, but she's coming from work, so she um, will be um, I, 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 haven't, I haven't got to apologies first. Oh, you haven't? I thought okay. this before we started. Um, <coughs> like we're talking about uh, just recording very briefly. There'll be a proper occasion to, to uh, give thanks for Malcolm Spalding's participation of the council, but just on this committee, since he was my predecessor uh, as chairman of this committee, um, we, I just thought it appropriate that we said a few words if we wanted to at this juncture. But if you could keep it short, that would be great. So anybody else like to add? Uh, I always thought Malcolm was a, a dear friend, a very respected colleague, uh, always very professional, very warm and friendly. Um, I also thought he was a, a champion of the back benches. You know, he didn't withhold what he thought. He, he told everyone that, uh, both the opposition and our own leadership. Uh, and I think that's great. He, he is the archetype of what I expect it to be a great ward council, and it, it, it is a loss to the council and a loss to us court. So it's, he'll be greatly missed. Thank you. What about you? One address. Yes, I'd like to echo what everybody said and 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 add. Um, he he was a, a true uh, example of what a local representative should be, and and he represented his uh, constituents with vigor, passion, and huge huge dedication. And he will be sorely missed. Max, Dr. Max. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd just like to. Um, reiterate um, what everybody said. He was um, uh, a champion for everyone, and no one was an exception. Um, no, um, and he, um, every time I had an interaction with him, it was always with a smile, <clears throat> and he was always very jolly. He had a way of persuading people, um, and he could hold a robust argument in a very civil manner, which a lot of people could take um, lessons from outside of the council. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, if we could pass on to the um, meeting itself. Uh, apologies for absence. I have apologies from Councillor Will, um, who is sadly ill at the moment, uh, Marina Cornwall, and uh, Councillor Charles O'Connor. I understand will not be here. Um, and uh, Councillor Porcester Thaxter is just beginning to be a bit late. Yeah, okay. Um, can um, as any councillor, any member have to declare an interest? I'll take your silences. No. Um, minutes of the previous um, select committee meeting. I've read them and I'm satisfied that they are correct record. Um, unless anybody has any particular issue to raise, um, I suggest we take those as read. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'll sign them in, in a minute. Uh, so if we could go to paper A4, the culture plan. Um, it's been circulated and you've all read it. Um, but Councillor Catherine Fawkes, would you like to say anything to that at the moment? Not really, as it's not my plan. Um, it's uh, Councillor Will's plan. Right. Um, but I, all I could say is that I think it was a huge success last year, um, particularly after COVID when we were focusing on bringing people back to the high streets and bringing people back to Kenston, Chelsea, by having a cultural feature, by all the amazing programme events that uh, Raina Cornwall managed to organise at incredibly late notice. And I, I know you've got the, the numbers here of uh, people that came to the borough as a result of the cultural festival. So um, all I want to do is congratulate the, the culture team, the Culture and Place team, for um, producing this amazing 
um, um, festival in such a, a short period of time. And I'm glad to see that it's, uh, it's going to continue. Is there any officer here from... Terry, is there anything you want to add at this point? Not really, apart from, I suppose, the timetable at the end. So, we basically, we produced a five-year culture plan to start with, um, but because of COVID, uh, that was reduced to a one-year plan because the culture sector was really badly impacted by COVID. So, we kind of really had to kind of focus it down on one year and what our response would be, and hence the delivery of the, like, the KNC Festival, which proved really successful and we'll be rolling that out again this year so again within the report it sets out the, um, the su uh, success indicators from last year but also the process we're following for this year and then also um, the timetable for the four-year culture plan that's in development at the moment I think one of the things that came out of our pre-meeting on this is a, a discussion around the branding of um, this festival because um, there were two parts to it effectively last summer, uh, Summer in Love and the Kensington Chelsea Festival. Um, and it, post COVID, it was very, very understandable as to why we had both of those parts and they were both individually a success. But I think one of the discussions we had was around whether we should focus on one brand um, uh, for, for the future. How, how does that sit with you? I think that was definitely one of the lessons learnt that there was kind of two programmes, I suppose, running at, at, together. So this year we are just focusing on that KNC um, festival as, as the brand and building yeah. on that. I mean, I think that the, the amazing cultural offer that we have in the borough, I mean, the obvious one is Albertopolis, but, um, you know, there are thousands of artists of, 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 and, and people from all walks of the artistic world in both in the south and in the north of the borough, from a, 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 a range of cultures from all over the world. Um, and you know, we have this enormous resource um, to, to, to build on. Um, and, and therefore, I think that we should, should uh, encourage uh, your team um, to build for the future with an ambition of, I mean, I, I, you know, I was at University in Edinburgh, so I saw the Edinburgh Festival and how that grew from early, early times through to you know, what it is now. Um, and with the, with the sort of content that we've got in the borough, um, we can build a, a, a very much bigger festival. Um, and the council's role probably is as an enabler rather than as a, as a producer of, of, of that. Um, but I, I anyway, wish you luck in that. And I think it would be interesting to see how um, local being business and venues um, f fit into that as well. Um, the, so the sort of locations. One of the things that came out of last year's programme was the bus tour around the, the, the borough, which was interesting to some people because it actually took them to places that maybe they hadn't been to in the borough before in an organised way to see events. So, you know, put, put events and places together as well as... You know, just a list of events. So, Agree, and that's certainly the ambition for the festival this year as well, is to have it spread out across yeah. the whole of the borough. So there's a lot of events in parks, a lot of events in estates. So we do try and make it as accessible yeah. as possible for everybody. If you look up some of the vi video streams from the Fête de Lumière in, in Lyon, um, that will give you an idea as to the potential of this goes. They have to have one-way streets for pedestrians. No vehicles allowed in the centre of Lyon at all. They have to have one-way streets for pedestrians because there's so many, two million of them are participating. I mean, it's not the scale of the, of the um, carnival, um, but across the whole, the whole uh, borough. But, sorry, Catherine Fuchs. Thank you. I was just going to add, actually, when we were coming on to the, the business improvement district in the, in the next paper, but of course, one of the great things that uh, bids can do is to fund creative and artistic events. <clears throat> so I'm very excited now, we have got three, that they will be investing some of their money. Um, I certainly know that the King's Road bid is going to do some spectacular things for yeah. around the Jubilee. And of course, as well as the culture, you know, we mustn't forget we have got all the Jubilee celebrations coming up, which will, again will cross over with, with culture. And one of the things uh, that um, Alex and our High Streets team work sort of across with the culture team is um, we're thinking at the moment about uh, renaming the the Town Hall Square out there, Jubilee Square, um, as a sort of celebration 
for the Jubilee, but also as a, a sort of very positive and exciting square that a lot more activity and events yeah. can take place. And, and just adding on to your idea, I know because I've discussed this with Councillor Will, is that it was very much her plan that, as you say, we, the, the council would initiate it, show how it could work, and then very much be a facilitator and hope that a sponsor or some business sponsors might come in um, yeah. to see this as a way of getting their name around the borough. Um, so hopefully that is a, a direction forward for this plan. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Councillor, Councillor Idris. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, you touched on uh, one of my questions, but the other one is uh, with the, on the culture plan, I was thinking about themes um, uh, annually. In, if, if we have it themed this way, uh, it gives it a little bit of prominence and it allows actually and invites people to sponsor it. Have you considered that? Thank you, Councillor. It's a really good um, question and a really good idea. So i uh, take that back to the team and I think we can definitely look at having some kind of shared theme across the whole event program. If I could uh, chip in there. When I was involved working with Verena on the um, Civic Gallery outside the door here, down the staircase. Um, she was very keen to put forward an annual program. We had a professional um, art gallery, um, Damien Rain Gallery, uh, can be, uh, as a, as a uh, uh, to, to, to put on the exhibition, to curate it. Um, and, but within that, there were monthly or six weekly changes to particular themes, but it was within an overall program which was curated. So there is the the option of having a lot of flexibility in the directions and in the locations, but at the same time, to pick up on Waller Idris's point, you know, to have an overall overarching theme or themes. Um, Maxwell, would you? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's kind of slightly on the theme, but particularly the, the uh, one of the best things about the previous that I thought was the Museum of the Moon. That was very eye-catching, you know, very pops, very Instagrammable, I suppose. Um, you, you know, you could see it everywhere. It popped around different venues. Uh, and it cuts across all ages. Um, I was just wondering, is there any thought process into what could be the su uh, successor to that? I don't know if you could do a star or another planet or you know, something you know, which is you know, <laughs> yeah. visually engaging and it could link into your theme uh, business potentially as well. It's a really good idea yeah, can, and um, it's already been booked in. So there's an Earth equivalent of the moon. So that's called Gaia and that's been booked in for um, the Jubilee Square. <laughs> That's great. Takes me way back, Gaia. <laughs> Pat, sorry, Pat Mason. So it's an Earth Festival in that case, no? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the Edinburgh Festival. Of course, I, you and I have probably been there quite, quite a number of times, and it's been going for decades. And, and, and in the beginning, it didn't have what we call the fringe now. That no. sort of came because people started to form on the streets and, the, and then council were trying to get them off the streets and so on. But then they eventually uh, decided this is actually quite a good, a, a good thing for business. And if you've been there, you'll see how massive the tourist uh, and visitor intake is. I mean, it's just a huge uh, commercial success as, uh, as well as the artists. And of course, we see in the, uh, the, the paper here, of course, they are talking about pop-ups. I mean. Uh, Young people and artists of every description, they need places to perform. Uh, London's not got too bad a climate, basically. So some uh, in Edinburgh, they, they, uh, the, the city council, as part of the fringe, put up uh, uh, mobile stages. Uh, and, and they have a system of booking people on to do stand-up comedy and all sorts of different acts under the sun. They've got areas where you can put out pictures uh, and every and then they extend it to all the shops, and you've seen this, uh, you, you've seen this. Um, and, and it becomes, uh, and, and in some places, it can become, um, uh, it, it, can, it can go beyond the Edinburgh Festival period, it can go for, for, for months. When we did 1958 Remembered here, I don't know if anyone was here when we did that, uh, it was something that was meant to last, it was to do with remembering the, uh, the, the, the events of 1958 and the 50 years of, good community relations afterwards. And we only planned it for about two weeks, but it went for a year and a half, because what happened is we put a, a, a committee together, probably a bit like they did with the Fringe, which covered voluntary sector and music businesses and all sorts of different people. And they decided 
what would happen in, in their area. They knew about their area better than we did. Uh, so, and they all had different premises that they, they, they had exercised uh, influence over, that they owned or whatever. So, and, and, it, and it just snowballed on, basically. I mean, in other words, it, it cost the council tiny amounts of money because they were all um, applying for funding from all sorts of external funders. But of course, it came under the umbrella of 1958 Remember, which the council, of course, was supporting, not as well as you should have done, but you were not here then. But, um, but um, it, 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 it was a success. But young, especially after COVID and the whole cost of living crisis thing, I mean, people just are down on their knees with cash problems. And my, my guess is that's going to go on for quite some time. So it's going to be very difficult to, uh, for people to have, particularly young people, artists and, and, and performers to have the money to hire premises or <coughs> to find ways to promote their art. There's one village, which is quite a large village in Scotland, I've forgotten what the name of it is, but once a year for a whole weekend, the whole village, every, not, maybe not every house, but almost every house uh, is turned into an art exhibition. They all do, the, the, throughout the year they're doing their art and you can walk down the streets for miles around and you'll see pictures in every garden. It's like a mini exhibition. They all do different things. But the thing is they do it and, and the council doesn't, the, the local council doesn't have to pay for that, them doing that. And they provide pop-up. There's, there's, there's garages that are emptied uh, and it becomes a, a, a mini art m museum. So there's, there's examples all over the, the country, from the Edin Edinburgh Festival, it's been going for decades, so it's huge and it's, it's, it's established. But you can start off doing that. You can allow, people will, people will tell you what they want. It says more or less that in here. But, um, but, um, but this is limited in terms of how many people it's getting to. There's a huge sort of music and cultural uh, and performance uh, ability out there. Portobello Radio, for example. I mean, you know, there's, there's, whatever you go, they're there. They can be they can be sucked in slowly over the years, and it can become almost self-sustaining. Uh, you know, right. uh, in terms of funding and so that, on. I think so that's a that's a fantastic. So, in, thinking of imaginative ways of um, stimulating local initiatives okay. uh, to flourish, flourish. Um, maybe with some um, organised pop-ups or, or you know those, those sorts of things. Yeah. So, last year the the, the festival there was a, an open call working with um, a lot of the different uh, theatres and creative kind of uh, organisations in the borough so like Chelsea Theatre, Fimbra Theatre etc Playground Theatre they all kind of had a takeover stage where yeah. artists could come in do their own performance you paid as much as you wanted to for the performances and they were really successful and the open call was hugely oversubscribed so there's definitely a market there there's a bit around quality control i think um, that needs to take place but um yeah i think that is a really growing area and that's something the council can help facilitate but doesn't really yeah. need to manage but you, you i think what you're saying is that there are examples last year and from that there are lessons that can be learned yeah. another, another thing that happened last year is there was a, a a section of the festival that was online are you thinking this year you'll still have a section online or are you not going to pursue that? Really good question. So I think that needs to be um, worked out still in the detail. Um, and it depends on some of the providers, but I think it is much more accessible if we can have stuff online as well and it does make sense if we've got the, the technology available yeah. to do that. And I'm thinking particularly of people who are isolated and so on who yeah. won't necessarily want to go on the street. Yeah, um, but there's, you know, there's sections of the community who thrive going on the street but others who, who don't like it so you know it would be useful to at least evaluate that so the council or um, not only people who um, uh, are isolating I think and I think I brought that up uh, last time about Notting Hill Carnival being a um, hybrid uh, because we've seen people uh, people it, it would be it, it would expose uh, our culture to people all over the globe if it if it goes online and I think um, we should seriously consider having an, an online option uh, just simply so that um, we can, you know, uh, we never know. Maybe people will say, this was so great online. Uh, I'm going to travel to London next year for, for that. Okay. Let's hope so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the a final question that I had was, um, do you feel that you've got sufficient response from the established cultural institutions 
um, because we have some massive ones within the borough. And the, I mentioned Albertopolis, but they're by no means the only, only ones across the, the borough. And, and also including, and Pat Mason mentioned the music performance um, capability across the borough, but we also have music publishing. I mean, I think 50% of the UK's music publishing or thereabouts is, occupies buildings just to the south of where we are. Um, so are you getting support from, from those institutions as well? We're, we're definitely linked into kind of the Exhibition Road uh, cultural group and yep. all the institutions associated with that. I think last year, because COVID, they weren't really operating at full steam. So it was more a kind of a council-led approach. But moving forward, we definitely do need to harness those relationships and harness the, the pull power that they do have. Sorry, Catherine Forbes just come in on that in terms of the music publishers again bringing in the bids uh, Warner Music who we know are just off Kensington High Street are uh, signed up to the bid and they'll hopefully be on the bid steering group so you know it's one of the great things about bringing our businesses closer to us okay. and working with us can I can I take that then we this is a wonderful segue to the next item on the agenda so um to, sorry Portia sorry pardon me I, I did thank you welcome. um chair I just want to know um on um, the cultural plan 3.13, it says the BAME focus trainee producer role was filled with assistance from RBKC Family and Children's Services. What is their role? Can you just elaborate on that? Because I've never heard of that. And how did you engage with the BAME community and what results did we, did we come up with? Sorry, Councillor, can you repeat this section of the report you referred yeah, to? Yeah, um, 3.13. The BAME focus um, training producer page five. Oh, yeah. It's about one, two, three, one, four. four. One, two, three, four. Four points down. Four bullet yep. points down. Okay. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one, Councillor, so I'm not exactly sure what that producer role um, provided, but I can get back to you if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so di uh, did you manage to record that? That's a. Uh, uh, Terry Oliver is going to come back with a, an answer for that. Um, so, thank you, Portia. Um, can I take my segue for, to, to the bids now? <laughs> Sorry, that was... So, Catherine Fawkes, is there anything you'd like to say by way of introduction? And um, people have... It's been circulated, people read it, so we don't need a full introduction. But is there any highlights you'd like to present? Um, OK, absolutely. Well, I mean, obviously, this is really exciting, and I just wanted to pay my tribute to Malcolm at this stage, because... Before, in the last sort of um, council administration, bids were very much frowned upon, and Malcolm was always incredibly keen on them and rather frustrated um, that we hadn't looked at them more. Um, and so I find it completely heartbreaking that in this paper we're considering doing an, an Earl's Court bid because he was just so excited after the Kensington High Street one went through, and he was going, this one next, I'm going to be behind it. And... Um, you know, seeing his beaming smile uh, talking about that was, was a really wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, if we can do anything about calling it the Spalding Beard or have some, you know, thinking that he was so behind it, I'd, I'd really love to do that. Because, um, as we say, he, you've said before, that he was such a supporter of, of businesses in this borough with, with his role with the Chamber of Commerce uh, and the various business organisations. Um, so, Malcolm, the bids are for you. <laughs> um, anyway, as you say, you've seen the paper, um, you know what a bid is, um, and because that's all explained here about it's a percentage of the rateable value, a levy um, is paid into a pot, and uh, in the last financial year, three bids in this borough improved, one in uh, Brompton Road, one in the King's Cross, and one in Kensington High Street, uh, which together with all three of these bids, um, our feasibility studies show that this should bring in about three million a year, so a, approximately a million, give or take, for each high street, of which the businesses and board will be able to decide how they are going to, to spend that uh, money. One of the things that sort of isn't really covered in this paper, and I won't talk about it unless you want to know more about it, is what they might be spending their money on. Um, so I, I'm happy to come back to, to that if you'd like to, to know more about that. Uh, and so moving on, um, and I just wanted to say how enthusiastic that the businesses were. And one of the really... Um, 
the huge benefits of having these bids, as slightly as I've just managed, is not only our relationships with the businesses, because I've got to sort of know all the big businesses on Kensington High Street that we hardly spoke to before, but of course it's them all speaking to each other uh, and sitting in a room together and actually planning how the high street could look and the things they could do with it. And I think that is just going to be transformative actually particularly transformative for Kenston High Street, because I think there were 398 different businesses on Kenston High Street and not one big overall landlord, which is where it differs from Kings Road and Brompton, where, of course, Cadogan, a significant landlord there, so had more sort of control at curating what was on the street or not. So I think getting all those businesses to work together um, is really, you're going to see some uh, um, incredible improvements. Um, but going forward, you'll see in the paper at 1.5 that um, there are three other areas that we're considering, uh, and obviously it would be good to, to get your views on those that you're, that you're asked for uh, in, in the paper. Um, and we're also discussing there are business improvement districts, but there are also community improvement districts. Well, at the moment, uh, there isn't a community improvement district. One doesn't exist in this country. But we've uh, applied to the GLA to see if they might consider doing a, pi uh, a pilot community improvement district, um, potentially on the Portobello Goldbourne Road area, which we think would be really exciting. Um, but again, as this paper explains, there needs to be some work, more work done on actually that, what does that mean and how do the community buy into it? How, what does the levy work? You know, do they have money or just control? So that's something that we're, we're, we're really keen um, to look at. So I'll probably leave that there and just see if you've got uh, any more questions or anything more you'd like to know about the sure, business okay. improvement districts. Um, I think first light that went on was Dr. Max Schwann. <coughs> Thank you, Catherine. Uh, um, or I should say, Ka Councillor Fawkes. Um, in Queensgate, as you know, there was quite a lot of interest um, in the business improvement district, and um, I'm, I'm glad to see community improvement districts because there was some confusion with that with my residents about what um, a business improvement district was. Was it going to improve, or was it going to um, affect the cultural heritage of um, their squares just behind the street, the high street? Uh, and thank you for reassuring them, um, which you did um, nicely. But could you just explain what the money is going to be used for so I can tell these residents? Because um, they seem to think that um, they, they are going to be excluded. Um, so I think uh, resident involvement is really important uh, in bids for exactly that reason, because I think the name itself suggests that uh, all the residential streets are going to be taken over by mm. businesses in some way or other, and particularly Kensington Square seemed to think that we were going to suddenly pop up markets and put a circus tent in the middle of the square or do Correct. some crazy yeah. things, which might have been fun. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I hopefully I did reassure them that um, business improvement districts, anything that would um, need planning or licensing that had to be agreed by the council would still need planning or licensing that would need to be agreed by the council. So they can't impose anything uh, beyond what you know what, what would already be allowed so they do have a real constraint um, so it's more really for the the benefit for the residents is that the the money will be spent very much on these roads spending it probably initially on uh, making it a, you know the destination so better marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously improving the look at the street they can top up the cleaning that's already been done under the council contract so they might decide to put extra cleaning on that and actually on Kensington High Street yesterday I did think it looked a bit grubby sorry Council Fellows <laughs> so um, it might be that you know they want to pay for extra cleaning extra removal of chewing gum cleaning the benches um, more more greening more plants and things like that um, and as I've mentioned before um, more uh, events but I think the thing that residents uh, actually might see the most benefit from is um, that most bids in, invest money in extra security. So again, that might be working with the council to pay for another warden, for example, on Kenston High Street, which would both be uh, helping businesses with shopkeeping or anything like that. They also tend to address um, homelessness issues, people on high streets. Um, and, and generally use a sort of information and directing people around as to where they go and what they might look at. So um, I think um, 
when they happen, hopefully your residents won't find it um, as terrifying as they thought it was going to be. I think it's a really positive, uh, positive thing that's going to happen. And we are going to have um, two residents um, on the board of the Kensington High Street bit, which normally there's only one, but because it's sort of on, there are residents on both sides and there seems to be a particular interest, um, um, we, that's what we're going to do. Thank so you please very much. reassure them. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Pat, Pat Mason. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, uh, you, you, you're covering some of the questions I was about to raise and to go back to front on the, on the, communi on the community improvement districts. Um, of course, uh, as it says here, that we, we would need legislation to create uh, the ability to do this. Um, but of course, uh, w w when you start uh, getting into this, um, I said, uh, of course, a, a referendum process to decide whether or not people wanted to see it, including the possibility of an add-on, etc. I mean, you can imagine how difficult that's going to be because if you have a, ref a, a, a referendum, I, don't, I, I assume the rules would, would stipulate a certain percentage of, of, the po of the population of a ward or an area would have to vote f for it. Um, but, I'm, but of course, I don't, I, I don't know that. But you can imagine that if, you, if, if, uh, if, if only a third of, of, of an area v voted, uh, as they do for, for council elections, incidentally, um, and that meant that the whole area had to pay, then you can imagine people would be, would be very upset. I don't think in North Kensington they'd be wanting to, 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 to do this for, to, for plants or to beautify the area, given the demographics and given the absolute poverty that some people are living in right now because of COVID and the cost of living crisis, etc. They are more worried about how they're going to pay for their children's uniforms, going back to school, rents, and all the rest of it. We can see the casework. So I think... Uh, uh, the, the offer would have to be something tangible for them. Even wardens, I think that we're, we're, we're still we're paying for wardens. They'd say, well, we're paying a levy to the, to, to the Metropolitan Police for policing and, and so on. I'm just saying the offer would need to be, the offer would need to be something tangible. I, I, I want to come back to building BIDs if you're going to answer this. Uh, can I do that, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yeah. carry on. So, so the, the, I mean, I imagine there'll be a whole lot of questions, and then there will be questions about who controls the money that is, that is collected. Uh, who's, who, who are these people on whatever body it is? I don't know them, they are not one of us. You know, uh, uh, how many, uh, there'll be endless arguments of, over um, how the money's spent, even if you get the money. Uh, uh, on bids, um, so as I understand it from this paper, uh, you, you've done it so you can tell me, um, X amount of businesses could could, would, could opt into a, uh, into a, uh, uh, um, uh, a business improvement district. If there's five, uh, do they have to? Do they all have to opt in or not? It doesn't quite work like that. In fact, uh, so they all had to vote on the ballot. There was a ballot for the businesses. Did they want a business improvement yeah, district or right. not? And then, as it says in the paper, of the businesses that voted. Over 50% yes. of the visitors yes. that voted had, yes. to, had to approve the bid and, yes. and over 50% of the rateable value. Yes. And actually it was much higher. I can't remember the exact figures, yeah. Alex will have them, but it was sort of in the 80 and 90% we did on both of those. But having been agreed it, all the businesses who have a rateable value over £30,000 who are in the bid area have to pay 1% of that into the levy. So if your rateable value is 30000 that's £300 yeah. a year. And, obviously, and we've got a cap so um, if, for example, you're the Royal Garden Hotel, where your rateable value is much more, the cap is at 50,000, is the highest amount you pay into it. And then there is a board um, which is set up with um, businesses, predominantly five large businesses, small businesses, some opt-in businesses who are even below the, the threshold of the rateable value. And it's the board that then um, uh, decides how the money is spent. So, so that's the process. So, you know, once, once it's been agreed, everyone has to sign up to it. But I completely agree with all the comments that you made about the community. Can, can, I, just, can, can yeah. I do that again? Pat, Pat, can I... Can no, no we, I need we, to come back are, on the bids. I, I, I need to come oh. back on the bids. I, I understand what the paper says. My question was, uh, if there are 500 businesses in an area, but only 200 or 300 opt to go into the vote, are all the others who didn't... Uh, are they all... They're all in, are they? So now they, that, they all have so, to pay. Right, they're all in. Can, so can, I, in, can, so I, can I just clarify one thing? I, as far as I understand, this is a system which is consistent across the country and has been laid down not, uh, you know, for us to follow. 
There's no negotiation with regard to what the process is. It exists. Right. And that is what has been followed by the Council, and I think it's a great success that we've managed. To, I didn't, I'm, I'm not surprised that Cadogan could do it, but I'm very uh, welcoming of the uh, achievement in Kensington High Street. Having lived off it all my life, it like, must have been like trying to herd cats, if that's the right expression. I'm allowed to use that one. But it, it must have been very difficult, to, and I'm very very, very encouraged by the fact that you've managed to get all these, and, and a great credit to you and your team. Um, so I, th I think at the moment we have bids and a question mark as to whether we look at the um, community uh, improvement districts at later, and I can appreciate that's much more complex. We're not really looking at, co at community improvement districts today in this committee. I suggest that's something maybe this committee would like to come back to in the future. But what I will say is that in, as, as a councillor, as an adjoining ward to the King's Road, that the um, King's Road bid have already reached out to local councillors in the adjoining wards and asked uh, not for us to be on the committee, it would be wrong for that, but for us to liaise with the committee and liaise with the people who are running it as to how, for instance, we can align our NSIL and our CLL uh, work in, the, in, in our ward and our lobbying of the council for various schemes and so on, how that can be brought to bear um, you know, such things as CCTV, wardens, uh, speed cameras, and on all of the new initiatives that have been brought up re recently, how they can be aligned with the initiatives that have been made within the bid, so that the sum is greater than, than the parts uh, of, of that. So I think it's, you know, well curated by good management. Um, uh, my experience has been in the, around the Kings Road area, that the beginnings of working with the community, but not a community improvement district. So I think that that, that, that and we lots of lessons to learn from that. But I think, Pat, if we want to talk about community uh, improvement districts, that's for another day. We, we do have a civic service to, uh, to, well, to go to after this. So I wonder sure you have, but, but if, you, if, you had, if you had allowed me just to finish, I would have finished by saying uh, I, wanted, I just wanted to, to speak to the Portobello, Westburn, Labrick Grove um, uh, initiative that may or may not happen, is that, that I accept it may have been a great, ex uh, a great success in Kensington High Street, but, but this will be a completely different kettle of fish doing it down in, in Portobello and Goulburn yeah. because every day, no, not, uh, not every day, every year, we councillors, and I certainly, um, fielding uh, cases of debt from uh, leases and, and, and rates into the council. It's going to be very difficult to get people to, to give 1% of... I mean, these people are really on the edge, some of these businesses. Uh, I, I, and that, I mean, I won't be here, so, so I've got nothing to grind on this, but it's going to be a really difficult problem uh, with businesses that are... Um, Pat, I uh, think you've you made know. the point well. Can I just yeah. come back on that, um, This Pat? is not Kensington High Street uh, down uh, we there. <laughs> I totally appreciate everything you're saying, which is why nothing would happen without a feasibility study, which has happened before any of the previous things, to actually ascertain whether it is something people are interested in doing or what. So, so, so don't worry, you know, all of those yeah. factors will be taken into account, I assure you. Thank you. Um, but, uh, Councillor Maxwell, would you? So just to chip in on the, uh, particularly the um, Portsmouth Market, uh, which I walk up, since I live pretty right at the top of the borough, in North Kent, um, you, a lot of um, businesses are very mobile there. They come in and trade on the weekend and disappear uh, during the week. So you'd have to obviously work out how you're going to have those arrangements. Uh, but potentially, you know, these are good, good ideas. We just need to work out the details. Uh, Councillor Idris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, although we kind of brushed on it, but the Community Improvement District, I was wondering, um, with the uh, business improvement, the businesses pay. Uh, with the community improvement, who pays? That's exactly the point I make. I, I, they, it isn't a fully formed sort of uh, thing yet, um, and so I don't think anyone knows exactly to, to, to Pat's, um, Councillor Mason's point, is that suddenly if you put a levy on the community lived a around the area, I could understand why they would be really um, resentful of that uh, and ask why they were paying. So, you know, it, it might... Uh, we, the answer is we would have to do a feasibility and study and see how it would work. If I could try to summarise then, um, I think we as a committee would greatly welcome um, the three bids that have been established and congratulate those involved in setting them up and wish, wish it all well. Um, I think it would be very useful to have a report next year um, to this committee as, as to progress um, that's been made 
I don't know what an appropriate time would be, but I presume probably six months from now or something of that sort, so in the autumn, um, because by that time things should have been set up and got going, um, and that we should have some, some feedback. It would be good to have perhaps some presence in the chamber of people involved in those bits, um, because these are very much um, self-organized uh, bids, and the curation that has gone in so far has been excellent, um, but it will depend on the people on the ground, and the flavor of each of the bids will probably be very different, and it'll be interesting to see the, 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 the difference in, in views, and also the lessons that could be uh, contributed from those experiences into the evaluation of whether there are other places to do bids or whether there are other types of bids, i.e. community improvement districts and later. So the debate could be continued usefully in the future, I feel. I just have it minuted so that I really want to thank um, Terry, Oliver, Verena Cornwall, um, uh, Sue Foster, uh, Alex Howell, who's sitting behind me, and Su uh, Sue Harris, that the, the Kensington High Street was um, incredibly hard work, and they were absolutely brilliant at getting it over the line. So thank you to them. Thank you. And, and officers, if you could make sure that that's recorded, that'd be brilliant, because there, there has been a lot of work being put in. So um, thank you very much. And if we could move on, therefore, on to the next item on the agenda, which is the, the Select Committee's report on Carbon Net Zero 2030. Um, and before we start, I'd like to say thank you to James Diamond for his stalwart um, efforts in, in knocking this in, into shape, because it is a very big subject. And in, in effect, we've been, as a committee, we've been working on this for uh, more than this year. We started during the last uh, council year. Um, and uh, the report that you have before you, um, has, uh, James has put in a lot of work. One of the uh, things that I'd like to point out is that we tried to cut down the uh, amount of paperwork that's presented to you at the moment. There are 16 pages. Um, there's quite a lot of detail and summary in that. And there's a lot of referencing of material that we, we uh, considered outside that, um, which is done on the page in the normal way, but all those links are hyperlinked. Um, so they're for quick reference, we're looking at it on the screen. Sadly, the way in which it's been printed tonight doesn't reflect James's efforts because what we tried to do was to get the, the, the really important page, I think is the page um, which has recommendations at the top that should have been on the right-hand side. There's a blank page just inside the cover and hopefully officers will ensure that in, that in future that if anything is produced in printed form, there's not a blank, blank page inside the front cover and that the contents should be inside the front cover and that therefore the recommendations page and the diagram um, come up on the right-hand side of the pages you're looking through the report. Now, the, the, the essence of this are those seven recommendations. Um, and, and I personally wrote an introduction, but I think the important thing that I'd like to bring out of that was the last sentence, is that I feel that a lot of foundations have been laid, but we now need to get on um, with implementation, because it's now time to build on those, those foundations. The declaration by the council was made in um, 2020, um, and we're now in 2022. And I know these, these scale of programs always take time to, to put into effect, but we are two years into, um, more than two years into a 10-year program for a very, very large project. Um, and that the, um, we, we've only got eight years left to uh, with the ambition of t by 2030. Now, the key points that I think came out of our working with the officers, and I'd like to pay tribute to Terry Oliver and his team and Sustainability Board, Anka Giorgio and, and, and others, and also to thank you to Johnny Thalassitis too as the lead, lead member. Um, but the key thing is that um, for many years, the um, climate change and uh, air quality um, program within the council did not include buildings. And only a few years ago did the council buildings come into this. And then when the ether report, which is probably the seminal report that you will have all seen coming through our deliberations, <coughs> um, did a study of the council's footprint, 90% of the job is in buildings and 56% of the total is in the council's housing um, uh, alone. So we do need um, to put a big emphasis on the focus on, on buildings. 
We also need to um, realize that we are still at early stages. There are some, there's the brilliant exemplary project of Lank West, which is probably nearly 10% of the council's housing stock in one project. And it's got special funding from um, government and other bodies. Um, and it's doing imaginative things like taking surplus heat out of the underground, hopefully, and through a district heating system, and then um, into fairly high budget measures on the fabric in the building. But this is not necessarily the approach that can be drawn on for the rest of the borough. We have a very diverse stock from street properties, uh, individual flats. Um, we have council estates have built in different eras of construction and architectural style and whim. Um, and therefore, it's a very diverse um, uh, uh, problem to, to deal with. <clears throat> the knowledge of that stock in thermal terms is only just being is assembled. There are thermal drones being flown around the um, Elm Park Gardens estate. Uh, and the survey of the schools um, is only starting mm -hmm. in May. Um, and the, the tackling double glazing in listed buildings is a subject that's um, happening in, in, in the sort of lead uh, project at Colville School uh, as, as we speak. So it is very early doors in this process, but our recommendations, um, if I could read those out and then ask uh, Johnny Thalassitis to, to comment on, on the paper. The fo we recommending we focus that the council should focus on thermal upgrading of council housing stock to energy performance EPCB as a minimum by 2030. And this also improves resilience on fuel property. Basically, what we mean by that is for those who, can't, who are poor enough that they can't afford any heat and they have to make choice between food and, and uh, heating, that they will be warmer as a result of having their property well insulated. And that is a, a fact of life and has been and will remain um, to be a fact of life for some time, particularly with the in increase in cost of fuel at the moment. But we uh, think that if you read the evidence, and I was recently sent a report by Terry Oliver from an organization called Nesta about heat pumps, um, <clears throat> which is calling for the day where soon when heat pumps will become um, cost effective and so on. But if you, that's the press release. If you read the 55 page report behind it and the, the, and the data in, in, inherent in that, they, <clears throat> they identify the hurdles that need to be overcome to make heat pumps actually work. And it's quite a long list. It's a big subsidy from government on installation. It's changing the production costs. It's changing the financial arrangements. It's changing the taxing of electricity and gas. And a whole paradigm changes ar around that to make heat pumps. Now, the, <coughs> the promise from ministers is that they will do that job within the next five years or so. But at the moment, unless there are special conditions, Heat pumps, you know, if you look at the Nesta report and other stuff that we've looked at, heat pumps are not cost effective at the moment. And therefore, there needs to be a very well thought through case in each uh, business case for each upgrade of, of, a, of a, a part of our stock to take, to take that forward at the moment. And therefore, that's why we put the fabric first, which is in the green plan, as our number one priority. So we are suggesting the delay of installation of heat pumps unless, not un as was originally drafted until, unless cost-effective or subsidized, powered by carbon zero electricity. Carbon zero electricity will only be available on a wide basis. Um, at the moment, the commitment by the government is 2035, brought forward from 2040 and, uh, as a result of the discussions at COP26 uh, last, last autumn in Glasgow. Um, so if we, at the moment, the working proposition is that we should have zero carbon electricity by 2035. As a result of the Ukrainian and Russian uh, situation, we may have an, an, an reinvigorated activity with regards to nuclear and North Sea wind. Um, so there may be uh, a bringing forward of that date. But engineering practicality would dictate that it's probably only possible to bring it forward by a, a small number of years. Um, the work on budget and housing revenue account review should be prioritized uh, to feed into the medium-term financial strategy, which is being dealt with in, in, in summer 22. That, interestingly, since we draft that, effectively that's been written into the budget review and the HRA business plan. So that's been taken, taken on board. Progress, the 2030 uh, uh, net, net zero offset provision hypothecated to achieving carbon zero. What we mean by that is that when we get to 2030, where there is any, any carbon 
being produced in, in the heating for um, our buildings, that, that there should be a provision. We, ha we can't call it a, a, uh, a tax because we can't tax ourselves as a council, but we can make provision in budgets. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is, is if the, the minister's projection on cost-effectiveness for heat pumps comes true and they become cost-effective in comparison with um, uh, uh, gas boilers within the next few years, the extra provision in the HRA that's required to install heat pumps will become zero, not, not uh, a net extra as is predicted at the moment. We think that the area of double glazing conservation areas is, a, is extremely important um, uh, aspect. Uh, an example of that would be the Colville School re refurbishment which is investigated by officers at the moment. There is a conflict between what the, um, the officers who are dealing with the refurbishment want to do and the planning officers uh, because uh, it is a listed building and therefore they're not allowed to use double glazing. That's being looked into and, and hopefully there'll be a resolution and part of, as I understand, as Johnny, you've announced that will be a consultation on double glazing in listed buildings with residents over the, uh, after the election. Um, so if, if that comes to be... If, if residents return a Conservative Council, of course, well, that, that, I, I, we can I, have I, no confidence yeah. that the Labour councillors in the chamber that, might do that. And so this, yeah. this is something that only a Conservative Council can pledge. Th thank you, Johnny, for that political point, which you, you won't be able to make after next Monday, but thank you for getting it in in time. But I think that the, the essence there is that if we look at the borough um, and, and our 2040 objectives, which are outside this paper, but... but are part of the general picture. We will not be able to get our, our, general, our general building stock and housing stock in particular up to any energy efficiency standard unless we can address the issue of, of double glazing. So it's a very important point. It's not just a small technical issue. And it, on the other hand, on the other side of the balance of that, there are residents associations and conservation uh, groups who are adamant that they don't want a lot of PVC windows plastered all over our heritage buildings. So there's got to be some some, there's got to be some conditional guidance, and I think it's important that those words, uh, Councillor, these conditional guidance means that you are allowed to do stuff, but it is a condition of you using the guidance that you do it that way. And if not, you don't have the permission to do it, and therefore you will be told to take it out. And therefore there's got to be some enforcement in, involved in that as well. It's not just giving people freedom. Um, procure, responsible procurement section... Uh, next, number six, is a responsible procurement section should be added to all key and executive decision reports. And there should be real-world exemplars uh, developed so that we can in enable uh, different departments to roll things out. Because very often we have a few key officers at the centre of a subject like this who understand in detail, but it isn't shown how to others how to do it. And we've got a very widely di uh, dispersed programme through all the schools, all the governance bodies, and, and so on around the council. Um, and then to the final one is that we should maintain the scrutiny, ESC and OSC's um, view on this, and the Audit and Transparency Committee, Committee's risk register should be in alignment. In other words, where there is not an alignment between the view of scrutiny and Audit and Transparency, the, the two committees should communicate with each other and ensure that they're informed. When I informed the Audit and Transparency of the risk that we've been told uh, around the HRA, the, at that time, there was no, nothing on the corporate register, and the Audit and Transparency Committee made sure the corporate register now reflects that risk that is being analysed under the earlier, um, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the number three, re the, the recommendation three, which is the work, work on budget and ha housing revenue account funding review. That those two things need to be lined up with each other. In other words, the work in the HRA team and the work in, in the, uh, um, the rest of the council and the budgets need to be aligned and anything that is not yet funded needs to be expressed as a risk in the corporate risk register. It now is, but it wasn't before this year. So um, I think it's, it's a success that the audit and transparency and this committee and through the OSC are aligned on, on, on this. So those are our seven recommendations and put in very simple terms in a diagram at the bottom we feel that the real target of the work at the moment is getting the fabric stuff moving and applying um, the right kind of heating, district um, heating or individual heating to, fired by gas boilers or heat pumps in the right balance according to cost effectiveness. Getting those moving on, in scale across the council because we only have eight years to achieve it. 
There will be a five-year program or so of installation of heat pumps after 2030 to catch up the, re the remainder of them to achieve total electrically powered heating systems by 2035 powered by a carbon zero grid. So all these programs align with each other and the financing of them. So that's the summary of the report. Chair, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, my question is actually, uh, reading through this paper, obviously we've got an existing housing stock, which is in, obviously in estates and, um, and, and, and um, individual, in, in individual housing blocks. What I'm trying to work out is uh, retrofitting is a, a, a big uh, a factor in terms of making, uh, cutting our, our carbon costs. So how do we work out um, uh, retrofitting estates versus individual housing blocks and individual flats? Because they're all peppered across the borough. Um, is, there, is there a formula? I mean, how do you work out w w what stage which property is at when it comes to um, what needs to be fitted? Well, you, you said it was a question for the paper, so perhaps Councillor Pascal would like to... Sorry, I, I, who are you asking the question of? It's to the officers. Right. So there is um, what's called parity projects and chrome analysis. So it's carbon reduction options for housing managers, um, which is a program we've used. Um, and that does a number of different scenarios. So um, applying kind of EPC B rating to all properties, what kind of measures are needed to achieve that. And it runs a number of different scenarios and modeling, which kind of gives us those those. Um, figures that we've got there, so the 97 million, and that, that can be applied to individual um, properties or it can be applied to estates. So we put in as much detail around our kind of property portfolio that we know, and then what comes out of that is that, that kind of 97 million. I'm just thinking it's also much easier to service an estate, yeah. which everything's pretty unified, as opposed to each individual one-off housing block, which is, I say, hidden away between, in, between other houses. Yeah. Um, and, and most of the properties are in estates or in blocks, so um, that will be our main focus, definitely. Um, I understand from Robert Shepherd that Jonathan Wade, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, it wasn't so much a question, just a point of clarification on, on the wording, and I was suggesting slightly different, which I think has been put up, but maybe it hasn't, um, it hasn't, got into the report. So, so in terms of consultation on the use of double glazing, we're in fact doing that at the moment as part of the local plan. So there is a draft policy uh, which basically says sensitive installation of double glazed window replacements is supported subject to fulfilling the council's statutory duties in relation to conservation areas of listed buildings. So that, that, that the policy position of where we're coming from uh, is part of the local plan and that, that consultation closes today after six weeks. So I think really that the recommendation um, was slightly more towards producing guidance on retrofitting for energy efficiency improvements for windows, including the use of double glazing in relation to the borough's historic assets, which includes listed buildings and conservation areas. So I think it's saying the same thing, but it's, it's slightly just clarifying the, well, the points that are made. I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm being a bit thick here, but I don't understand the difference between that and what's been said, because basically what we're asking for here is that there should be consultation on how to use double glazing in conservation areas. Well, uh, yeah, that's slightly different though, isn't it? Because we're saying we support it. We've consulted on um, whether it's appropriate to use, we will support uh, the installation of double glazing and we're producing guidance on it. Yes, but the, but, the, the, but the point here is, and what we're talking about, is that that guidance should be conditional. In other words, if permission is given by the council or by, the, by, by planning colleagues um, to allow uh, against the policy that's been hitherto, where you're not allowed to put double glazing in a listed building in particular, but it's not encouraged in conservation areas either, that if we are going to change our stance as a council on that, then it needs to be done in a way that is appropriate and, 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 and sympathetic to the objectives of the conservation areas. Because there's, there's, there are differences of view, even within English heritage, 
as to the difference between conservation and preservation. Preservation would be that nothing changes. Conservation is that basically the id of the buildings should be, should be preserved. There has, even in listed buildings and in conservation areas, new technologies such as um, telephones and uh, fiber optics uh, and such like have been introduced. They have not been banned. They have been asked to be introduced in, 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 in ways that are sympathetic and do not ruin the, the conservation and listed buildings. Now, in that context, I think it would be wrong on one side, or be, be, it would prevent um, uh, us making our fabric and our listed buildings more uh, energy efficient if we don't allow any change. On the other hand, if we allow change as a permitted development without any guidance which is enforceable, it would release the possibility where we could have PVC glazing plastered all over our beautiful buildings, which is obviously what we don't want to do. To strike the balance of achieving the two aims of getting a better fabric thermal um, resistance with preserving the nature of our buildings, there are going to have to be some guidance. But that guidance needs to be conditional guidance and not informative guidance. I mean, you, many times in planning committee, you tutored me on the difference between those, those two. So that's why we put the word conditional in there, because we think that any guidance produced here to allow people to put double glazing in listed buildings should be conditional. In other words, you do not have the permission unless you do it under this guidance. And if you don't do it under this guidance, it can be enforced and you can be taken, uh, you know, you can, the, the enforcement can require you to take it out and reinstate. Yes, but that would, I, I mean, clearly, listed building consent would, would still be required, well, in certain circumstances anyway. But I, I think the point I was making about was whether we consult on how to use double glazing rather than produce guidance on retrofit, uh, how producing guidance, which is what we've been talking about. Now, we could consult on it, but it would have to be through a supplementary planning document. So we'd have to well, produce a new supplementary planning document. If maybe we were maybe to there needs to be an element of J Johnny, perhaps you'd like to say something on this as well, because I understood that, that just as you're, you have consulted with the community on basis of solar um, collectors and other things at the moment, that after the the, the events of the next few weeks, you wish to address the subject of double glazing. Maybe I misunderstood, but I thought that's where we were. No, that, 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 that is what I would like us to do. I'd like us to look into a local listed building consent order into glazing. Uh, that, that is something that I think could be useful. But I think if we, if we, if we have a, 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 a vote in favor of that from our colleagues in the community and the various societies who are more learned on this than many of us are as individuals, that, that, and if the consensus after that is that we should go ahead with, with changing the, mm -hmm. the regulations with regard to this, and if we are then going to produce some guidance as to how it should be done, if we give that permission, then the permission needs to be uh, conditional on the guidance being followed, because otherwise it's, it's just purely informative. And it won't, lots of developers who take on board a, a listed house in a terrace won't take any notice of it. No, well, the way a local listed building consent order works is that there would be a, well, for example, the one on solar panels, there's a small number of conditions relating to the materials, the fixing, the size. Uh, and although there isn't a formal yep. planning permission process, if you don't meet those conditions, you can't crack on with the works. So the same would apply here in, if, if we did a local listed building consent order in yep. glazing. And I, I thought that's what we'd done in in a very short form in, under that recommendation. So yeah, but you're, yeah. you're talking about conservation areas, not listed buildings. Um, that, that's part of it. That I, I'm just a little concerned that we're conflating different issues um, and not actually perhaps just dealing with the whole of it. So what I've tried to do is to say that we're dealing with not just listed buildings, we're dealing with buildings in conservation areas as well. A listed building consent order will deal with listed buildings to a degree, but we're yeah. not dealing, we, I thought we were going further than that and dealing with buildings in conservation areas. And that's what the guidance is about. It's about heritage assets, which includes yeah. conservation areas and listed buildings and producing guidance on both. So, so if, if we were to change recommendation five from what it is now saying in conservation areas, if we changed it to in listed buildings and conservation areas, would that cover it? 
would, but you're still talking about consulting on it. And we could consult on it, but the only way we can consult on it is if we do a, a, a supplementary planning document. So we were going to produce guidance as to how best you should do it. Right. We could consult on that, but it would have to be through a supplementary planning document, um, which would be the, the way we would do it. Right. If we're producing guidance, we could, could do could, that. Sorry, could I, ask, could I ask the lead member as to how he would like to handle this? Because I think, you know, we've got to get a sense of words I mean, in here. I think well, we're roughly... I think, getting... Couldn't you easily say making it easier to uh, glaze buildings in, in you know, listed buildings in conservation areas? That would be captured by the proposed listed building consent order. Yeah, sorry. My, my concern is I actually think we need to consult and I actually think we have a, a wealth of knowledge in the borough and we need to you know, include them in the decision. We can't just sit here, um, a, a bunch of us, and decide on something as huge as this and, and, and make it uh, our law. Which, um, it needs. It needs to be. I, I think it needs to be consulted on by, and, and the residents needs to be involved. Every everything is being consulted on. Uh, so the policy steer, as John described, has been set out in the draft local plan. If we introduce a local listed building consent order to make it easier and allow residents to bypass the formal planning process when they install double or triple glazing in these listed buildings, uh, then that would also be subject to consultation just as the solar panels listed building consent order has been over the past couple of months. Uh, so there would be a six week period during which residents could respond. Uh, and we may choose to modify uh, the order on the basis of what we hear uh, or adapt it in a slightly different way. Or, or indeed, if, if there was a particularly strong pushback, I suppose we may not take it forward. Although my experience on the doorstep and as the lead member has been that there is some demand uh, for us to make it easier to double glaze in heritage buildings because it's probably the single most useful thing you can do to improve the energy efficiency and, uh, in, in, in these, in these okay. sites. I, I, I fundamentally, my sense is that there's no fundamental disagreement here. We're, we're, no, we're casting around for the words. Maybe if we can't find the precise words uh, to satisfy the lead member, the planning officer and ourselves now, should we be asking James for you to take this on board to redraft and circulate to the committee. Can we do it that way? Hmm? Well, the, re the report chair has been brought for the committee's attention for tonight for the committee's agreement, and this is the last meeting of the municipal year. Right. Could well, we I, I think that we... My, my recommendation would be that we leave it as it is. Maybe we add the word listed building in there or listed building consent order in there as well. Um, but we leave it as it is because we otherwise we'll be here to well past our finish time, which is 15 minutes, um, because we've got civic service to go to. Um, and then we, we also make a recommendation that officers and lead member respond to this. Because at the end of the day, the lead member and the officers will be, you know, the executive and the um, uh, arm of the council. We're only making a recommendation. So... The response to this recommendation may be that there's a better way of, doing, of, of wording this, and you, that, which is what you're going to do. But I think that I think we can't negotiate. Uh, we haven't got the time to, to wordsmith this at, at the moment. So my recommendation to the committee is that we leave the recommendations as they are, that we pass them, and we pass them across as recommendations to the lead member, Johnny Thalassites, for him to work with his officers and come back with a response. And if that is partially accepted and the way we're going to word it ourselves is this and we thought it through as the leadership and, and officer teams in the council then we've done our job as scrutiny because our job is not as scrutiny is not to tell you how to do it but to raise the issues that we think that need to be solved is that is that fair now can i put that to my committee that that we leave the recommendations as they are probably the best thing to do chairman because in my experience these recommendations will change they'll be varied they yeah. will change I've been on these committees M my first committee on this council was the <coughs> environmental services committee and guess what they had environment the new environment plan on on the the agenda Fantastic. and they changed within months they had changed uh, one year after the other 
you know, and 30 years later, we're still discussing this. Uh, we're, just, we, we're, we're still here. That's why I haven't said anything. Because I've, I've been saying, speaking on these issues for 30 years, and this was the, my very first meeting in 1991. Uh, so I, this yeah. will change. I, I agree. Can I can I accept maybe your seconding I'm, my proposal that we that we uh, uh, adopt this report as drafted. Well, adopt it, yes, yes. Uh, uh, we will do uh, it. As, is the committee, I is the committee happy I, to, to, to accept the report yeah. and its recommendations to put to the lead member? And the lead member will come back with lots of wisdom yes. and one or two changed and improved uh, things, and then he will, and officers will carry out the programme forward. And they, next year's committee can ask him further questions. I at least won't make any cheap political points like the lead member did without any substance whatsoever. Uh, you know, I could make lots of them, but I don't. You always do it, and it's very boring. I've listened to this for 30 years. It's incredibly boring. It, it, it demeans your, your office. I wouldn't do it. Uh, just don't do it. It's just irrelevant, you know. Okay. Um, I, I've, so, I've already seconded. So, uh, right, uh, okay, so committee. Can, I, can I just take yes. this opportunity to thank Councillor Mason for his 30 years of service on the council. Uh, he brings a lot of expertise and knowledge to the committee, uh, which we have to take on board. Uh, and I, I want to use this opportunity, as it may be his last meeting of scrutiny here, to pay tribute to his personal contribution on these matters, uh, because I think he's brought an awful lot to this council over a long period. And I know that members yeah, yeah. across the chamber value that and hold him in very high esteem. So a, a note of thanks from me on that point. Uh, and and I, I, hope, I only hope that his successes will be uh, just as lucid in these meetings as he has been over that long yeah. period. Agree. Uh, gentlemen and <laughs> mem members, members of Please, may I call my members to order? Pat. I'm, I'm Pat, yeah. Pat. So, we are adopting the report as, as, as worded, uh, in the knowledge that further light will be shone on it by officers and the lead member in, in, in their response. Um, so, thank you for that. So, if I could move on to uh, item A7, um, which is the work program report. Um, now, we've had that circulated basically um, the uh, start of the municipal year, the select committee set forward, forward four areas to prioritize the local plan, net zero, environmental management, and culture. Um, and that the report reviews the progress and scrutiny that we've done during the year and the impact that it may have had on policy. Um, so at the end of the municipal year, I think we can see from the report the select committee's focus on those priorities and delivered a lot of accountability and scrutiny. Um, but I wanted to just check that, that everybody, um, undoubtedly we haven't done everything, um, and there's a lot of work still to be done. And one little fact that I'd like to bring is that even if we carry out this uh, immense program of the 2030 target um, over the next eight years, and successfully thereafter through to carbon zero, that that is 1% of the job of getting the borough into that position as well. So there is an enormous program towards the 2040 target, and I think it's a challenge. We've done some, some starters this year on, on, on uh, listening to what officers have done a consultation out with partners, NHS, Albertopolis, and the uh, commercial community and, and the um, alternative housing providers, et cetera, um, the major estates and so on. Um, there's been consultation and, and, uh, uh, that started but I think that the work of getting the whole borough into that is, is a big piece of work that we leave for a future committee. Um, have a, having said that, that some of the objectives for the NHS um, and people like the Cadogan Estate and some of the, um, you know, the, the housing providers are actually up to or ahead of some of the stuff that we've done. So you know, it'd be, it's a partnership thing. This is not us leading the charge. We've done a lot of good work in our own camp but so it's, we need to recognize the work done by others. The work the NHS is trying to do at the moment is quite astounding in terms of they're looking at the way in which they look at the whole provision of health care, not just the question of whether their buildings are energy efficient. Um, and when you think about the miles that patients travel to hospitals and all of that, new models of health care, et cetera, it's going to revolution, potentially revolutionize the way that we work, that we are, you know, work our... Um, different systems in society and so on. So 
There's lots still to be done, but not for tonight. Um, so under the work program, are the select committee happy with the re report and happy to adopt it? Um, is there any other urgent business that needs to be mentioned tonight? I think I, I, I would like to say a couple of things. I'd first of all like to say thank you to all of you for being members on the committee. Um, thank you for your contributions, um, coming to our work from different angles and perspectives and different parts of the borough. Um, so thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, and I would also like to pay particular uh, thanks to the officers who supported us, to us, and I, I suppose the, the, the officer who's done most to support us has been James Diamond, because he has... Um Thank you, Chair. Noted. So, um, I, I think he's, he's been a... a uh, it's been very interesting working with James. He's, he's been very good at um, uh, knocking me into shape on occasion, um, but he's also done an immense amount of research outside the borough into um, academic and... Um, uh, local authority, organization, and governmental, BEIS, etc., referencing. As you'll see in this report, there's a lot of referencing material there. So if you're interested on a particular subject, use the hyperlink, go into some of that, and there's a lot, lot of material. Um, and his skill in putting this report together, we've got what would normally be, I think, in council terms, probably a 200-page report in 16 pages with punchy recommendations, even if they're not perfect, um, and uh, a, a, a um, hyperlinked reference to all those sources of information, which I think has been you know, quite an eye-opener as to what can be done. So I think we, we as a committee ought to owe James a thank you for challenging the way in which scrutiny might produce some of its material in the future, and dare I say it, even some wider uh, council reports. Um, I'm, I'm looking at some officers around here who regularly produce 200-page reports. Um, I think it would be good to have much shorter reports with much wider availability of information by using modern methods as invented by James. So um, thank you, James, very much indeed. We perhaps we ought to have put you on a lecture tour around the departments. <laughs> so um, unless there's anything else, I would like to um, uh, draw this meeting to a conclusion and this year's work to a conclusion, and thank you. No, I think there's a civic service that some of us wish to go to. So.